How do you determine the insurable value of a building for flood insurance? Hi, it's Dave Dickinson with Bankers Compliance Consulting. This is a complicated topic, one in which I've done a series of videos and I want to discuss probably one of the most common approaches is for lenders to use the appraised value. Now, what you see up in your screen right now, picture of a cornfield. I, I live in the middle of Nebraska. I look out my windows, that's what I see. Imagine that my house is there and let's say it's worth $250,000. Now let's move that house to one of my favorite places on the earth, and that is just south of Monterey, uh, California. There's a place called St. Lobos, Point Lobos Park, and it's what you see here. Looking south, you see the Big Sur in the park. There are sea lions and otters, and, and it's just a beautiful place. Imagine that we take my house and we move it there. What's it worth there? It's still worth 250,000. And you might go, wait, no, 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 be worth millions of dollars. No, the land is worth a lot. The price of the brick and the shingles and the uh, lumber at the Home Depot or Menards in Monterey is about the same as it is in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now the labor might be a little more, you might be able to argue, but basically when we come to appraised value, we're not talking about market value. We're not talking about what somebody's willing to pay for it. That's location, location, location. Supply demand drives those prices up. When it comes to flood insurance and hazard insurance, we're talking about what does it take to put the building back. So the three-pronged approach to most appraisals are the sales, sales comparison, the market value. That's definitely not what we want. There's the income approach. That's not what we want for insurance. We want the cost approach. Trying to determine the cost approach, the cost of the, the brick, the shingles, et cetera, for flood insurance and for hazard insurance is what you're after. Now, let's go back and talk about hazard insurance versus flood insurance. When it comes to hazard insurance, I want to call them the apples. Most insurance policies do not give 20, 30 cents, or may only give 20 or 30 cents on the dollar to anything below ground. Why? Think about a fire. How does that damage the footers and the foundation or the basement? It doesn't. And so if there's some type of catastrophe, like a tornado or fire, basically we're going to start from the ground and build it back up, but we probably don't have to worry about the foundation, the footers, etc. When it comes to flood insurance, yeah, we do have to worry about the foundation. In fact, it may be that we have to tear all that out and start over because maybe the foundation has been compromised. So when it comes to hazard insurance and flood insurance, it's like apples and oranges. It's not the same thing. And to use one to determine the other is really not sufficient. Now, there's a lot more to this story, but I hope that you understand that these are different animals and that we shouldn't be just taking hazard insurance to determine our amount of flood insurance, although that is what most lenders do. Be careful of this. There have been lots of floods in this history of our country that have shown that having the right amount of hazard insurance for your flood insurance, or let me try that again, having the same amount of flood insurance as your hazard insurance is not sufficient. And that is your collateral and your borrowers may be suffering because of this. Now, this is really something insurance agents should be discussing with your borrowers, not you. You're not an insurance expert. So I hope this helps you understand, though, the complexity of insurable value. Thanks for watching.